a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Nonetheless, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat and dive deep. Yeah. Absolutely. I appreciate your time. Awesome. So the first place I wanted to start actually in doing some homework on just your experience, your expertise in business is what was it like when the uh, Pokemon card industry and just sports card industry started to blow up the past couple of years? Because that's something that I believe you got into before it was even hyped up the way it is. That's correct. I, I got into it um, uh, way before it got hyped up. And um, I would say uh, when it started to get really hot, highly collectible, it was, um, it was, first of all, the demand was huge. So all my customers want it and they can't get enough of it. So um, the first thing you have to do is satisfy the needs of all your customers. And if you don't, that's when you can lose customers because they want what's hot, especially these large uh, retailers like Walmart or these brick and mortar chains like FYE, Wegmans, uh, people like that. They are, um, when something's hot, they'll know about it because they have all their customers coming to the stores or all their data from their uh, sites, platform sites that say, we want this product. So the first thing is to manage um, the amount of goods you get in properly. It's, it's probably one of the first times that you have to actually allocate instead of just ship, 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 ship. So I have to allocate to my customers because I don't have enough product especially for Pokemon and baseball. So that's the first part. The second part is it's, it's awesome to see such high demand sales and they're probably ranked the highest in the sports and gaming categories. So it's nice to have one of the hottest products in the, in the world. And um, yeah. the most interesting thing is, especially about Pokemon, is I sell to many countries across the world and it's hot in every single country. Every customer reacts the same. Every person, every country reacts so similar. Hundreds of countries, I'd say about 122. And for the Pokemon brand, everyone's the same. Everyone likes one release more than others. It all is a balance. And that's the one thing I've learned the most is the world is more similar than we know. Our country, Japan, United Kingdom, Europe, Germany, Canada, Mexico, um, not China, but and not Russia, but yeah. all, play, all those countries, they all have the same similar needs and wants of products that the United States has. And I find that the most interesting uh, part about this uh, trading card business. Right, right. I didn't know that about the, the countries. I mean, because... I consume a lot of stuff on social media that's based on what's happening in America. Um, I don't know of the pulse of those other countries, but you're the one that's shipping them out there, most likely. Um, what country is highest demand for it? Is it America? Uh, America is number one. Yeah. Kind of look at it. It's very interesting. It doesn't go um, exactly like GDP, gross domestic product per country and our demand for Pokemon cards and other uh, gaming cards. Um, I would say USA is number one. Uh, Canada's number two. United Kingdom's number three. Germany's number four. And then there, there, thereafter. Like, look at the GDPs. It's very interesting. Right. Only one that doesn't go in line with GDP with trading card demand is Japan. Japan's our fourth largest economy. Sorry, number three. And um, I'd, they're not even in our top 20. Wow. Yeah, they're such an independent, unique country. <laughs> That's exactly it. They're very yeah. independent, unique. They're very big under their culture. And I, they like their cards in their own language, too. So the cards right. I they, are only English, only American, English-based cards. Wow. Wow. I can see why it'd be more valuable for people in Japan. And also, it's. I was watching a documentary, and uh, I think video games, some of them actually started in Japan. So I think they have just like a, a real curiosity and fire for those things that are not mainstream until now baseball cards and Pokemon cards are, but stuff like the that. Pokemon, Pokemon started in Japan. Yu-Gi-Oh! started in Japan. It all starts in Japan. They're the creators of these characters and these games. 
and then we get it a couple years later. Pokemon is 100% Japanese based. <laughs> wow. So with that, like we're talking about the, the kind of public facing side, there's probably so much that goes into it logistically. I would love to backtrack a little bit and how you basically got going with your uh, logistics business. Cause I know you own a couple businesses. You have a whole firm that owns them. Right. So how did you go about setting that up? Did you have expertise on logistics beforehand? What was that process? Very good question. Uh, it's a twofold answer because we have uh, two part, two main retail systems in our world, e-commerce and brick and mortar. Okay. So with brick and mortar, I have thousands of stores that I only ship to in the United States. And those stores were set up initially with a very, very extensive replenishment system. So let's, let's look at trading cards in general. Brick and mortar, I sell all brands, including baseball, um, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, select Magic the Gathering products. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. Um, but what happens is when you set up brick and mortar, every store has its own demographics, right? So there's a location. That location has certain consumers shopping in that store. So the system has to be set up so that we read sales by item on a daily basis. And the way we make the system a success for trading cards is we replenish or ship back to those stores the items they, they sold in a certain period of time. And that sounds pretty simple, but it's not. Because guess right. what happens when you have 2,000 releases a year between all the brands? It's bigger than movies. So what happens, yeah. you have to manage that. You have to bring them in at the right time hold them in the right areas at the right time for the right people. And you do it probably about every day of the week. There's a new release. I would say, I would say three times a week. So um, that's how the logistics work. Also with logistics, we ship to every single store individually um, so that we get the product to the stores faster. So let's say the release date is March 25th. We get into the stores right around that day or before. We don't go through other distribution centers and then to the stores. So we have like 3,000, 4,000 locations we ship to. So logistically, wow. it's challenging, but that's the only way to work fast and get the product directly in the hands of the right customer for the right release. So that's right, so if, you, if, if you didn't vertically integrate the business, it would be harder. If we didn't vertically integrate the business, I would say, I don't know if it would be harder. I mean, we do manufacturing too. So we manufacture oh, wow. a lot of products that we sell in. That gives us higher profit margins for goods that we put together, clamshells or make accessory items that the cards go into. Um, vertical integration. Let me think about the top part. Would vertical integration help? I think... Um, it would help, but I don't have like, I don't have, um, I don't have ownership of the space at the store level. The retail. Oh, I see. I see. They own that space. Right. But you, do you have like your own delivery fleet? Is that outsourced third party or is that? Um... Question. That is outsourced third party, UPS, USPS, or. Uh, right, right, right. And I also service some of my stores. And that is outsourced too. So people go in the stores, they clean up the stores, they'll get us inventory levels. They'll tell us, hey, um, we need more of this. We need more of that. Kind of gives us the eyes on the retail shelves, what's going on the retail shelves. Right. That's the brick and mortar side, which is my major distribution for FJ Holdings. Uh, these, my biggest relationships um, and suppliers are for brick and mortar. Now, like everyone, I've expanded into e-commerce with like Walmart, and that's been a powerful expansion and very fast. Right. And we could talk about that a little bit. It's a different type of logistical system. <laughs> it's a whole nother ball game. Whole yeah, ball yeah. Game. Yeah, I'd love for you to dive into that because I the brick and mortar side, um, because I'm in food, I'm somewhat, I understand like the PAR system, make sure each store has the right amount for the right demand for that demographic. So that's that's incredible, incredibly valuable for people listening as well. 
because that might spark something in them. But for e-commerce, it's a totally different world from what I know. And I would love for you to expand on that because it seems like drop shipping is, is with digital expand, uh, exploding, drop shipping and all that's critical for this. Yes, yeah. it is. And it's growing. Um, e-commerce, there's, there's, there's uh, three or four main people, companies, large companies that I work with. Uh, Walmart is uh, one of my largest um, Amazon for select brands because I'm not allowed to s- sell certain Amazon products on Amazon. It's not, sorry, not certain Amazon products. Some of my trading card collectibles, I'm not allowed to sell on Amazon, but Walmart, I am eBay. I am. Um, and that's a whole, it's basically a whole nother business, the way it operates, same customers, similar customers. There's just a different shopping pathway that has expanded exponentially in the last seven years. Right, right. So I could start by saying, like with Walmart, we have two ways that we uh, ship products. One is directly to the customer and one is fulfilled by Walmart. So we'll ship it to one of their warehouses and they'll offer expedited shipping to the customers. And it's like Amazon two-day shipping. It's it's basically Amazon's more famous for the two-day shipping or free one-day shipping. And uh, Walmart does exactly that. It's been fierce uh, competition to Amazon. I see them, uh, they're directly competing head to head. I see it, I price everything between the two chains and I could just see the consumer shift from one site to the other based on who has a better price. That's how competitive it is. And it's getting more and more competitive, which is good. We want competition. We want people to compete. We want the, one of the largest companies in the world to have competition so they can't control the suppliers, people like me, or even the customers, and the customers don't know about it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we either have seller fulfilled or uh, fulfilled by the company, which is Walmart or Amazon. Um, and both systems, um, I control pricing, basically. So I'm always looking to see what the pricing is in the marketplace and also what my manufacturers, the brand licensors like me to price things at, because I always work very closely with my suppliers. And um, I would say with Walmart, we've grown quite a bit with baseball, um, it, a lot. Like it's been, and baseball is one of the hottest brands right now. Uh, in the last three years, it has surged like Pokemon in the last four years. It's like those two categories have went 10 times higher than a Yugi or a Magic the Gathering. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a great industry in the sense that it keeps on expanding. It's an expanding industry, which, I mean, those are the industries to get in, not retracting industries. Consolidation is right. tough, right? People buying each other out, very, very cutthroat. Dealing with Walmart and Amazon is pretty cutthroat, trust me. <laughs> especially when you go globally and you ship to other countries and you have the governments to deal with. And they're kind of a pain in the butt. I mean, they're not fun. Yeah. So many different governments, but uh, when you, when you ship through e-commerce, basically what e-commerce has done is it's targeted the su- consumers right to the website. So think about it. When you go shopping on the website, the consumer could look at a million items on one platform. You can't do that in a brick and mortar store, right? So right. You've got to make sure you're shipping the right product to the right stores. E-commerce has a competitive advantage because they compete against brick and mortar. And that competitive advantage is they could have 2 million listings, 10 million listings. They have every item ready right in front of the customer. That gives them a competitive advantage. So they could have more products, more variety, more selection, um, readily available to the consumer. And I do see that. I do see that with like Walmart online. I mean, we have it all. We have it in stock for the customer. So they could go there knowing they're going to get it. Right. Yeah. It's amazing to see since Walmart bought jet.com, how mm-hmm. much they're competing with Amazon and getting closer. It was a distance before where Amazon was just ahead of the race in, in this e-commerce space. But man, I, I, I see Walmart. I prefer them even just as much as, as Amazon when it comes to shipping stuff. That's a good point. They did buy jet about three and a half years ago. We were doing business with jet um, before they merged and after they merged. Uh, but Walmart has taken their biggest power moves, their biggest positions when they started doing fulfillment by Walmart. And now right. something that the consumer doesn't know about around the world is Walmart is going to start doing fulfilled by Walmart in Canada and Mexico this year. They're going to start doing that globally. They're going to compete with Amazon globally. 
They're going to have fulfillment centers in Canada and Mexico this year that we already know about. It hasn't started up yet, but when that starts, guess what starts? Competition. And that's good because Amazon's a very large company. And when companies get, I said this, I'll say it again, but companies get too big and powerful, they start doing things that don't make business sense. They right. feel invisible a little bit and all the power to them. They're the biggest company in the world. I've seen other companies do it. Walmart in 2003, I think they were one of the biggest companies in the world. They used to act a little weird too sometimes. So it's always good to keep everyone in check. Keep everyone in check, especially in business. Let there be a competitive uh, brand or competitive platform or competitive brick and mortar retailer. So we all compete. And it's sometimes friendly, but sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a rough game. I'm not going to lie. It's not easy. <laughs> business is not easy. Distribution. And you're talking about the largest brands, the most popular, collectible, famous brands. And then you're talking about the biggest companies in the world you're selling to. It's not easy. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that gets me. It's like, imagine making a product. Well, first, you have to get the supplies, make it in a, in a facility. And then just the distribution. I mean, you have truckers, you have planes, you have websites people buy. It's just, it's so amazing ships how it too. all works in unison. Ships too, man. Ships too. <laughs> yeah, yeah containers. We ship by ship across the Pacific to, you know, Asia or Europe. We don't always air it because if you air it, it could be quite expensive. So it's kind of cool. Oh, all see. the transportation you could think of different uh, uh, automobiles and planes. So with the supply chain issue that occurred, you have to think about some macroeconomics when you're doing all this. I mean, you talked about how you look at the pricing uh, with your suppliers to make sure you're making a profit. So how did you adjust to that period? And maybe still it's going on now. So very, 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 very good question. Initially, let's call it the COVID era, which we're kind of still in, but it's really phased down right now. There was a shift in a lot of brick and mortar business to online. A lot of brick and mortar companies went out of business in the last two years because of COVID, because people are shopping more online because of the lockdowns or because of COVID. And basically people have became more adverse to being one-on-one -on -one as much as uh, before. So what happened basically was we shifted from more from brick and mortar to e-commerce. That's number one. Okay. Now e uh, brick and mortar is getting much stronger again. Thank God we got a nice balance of distribution between both trades. Now, what else happened? Um, prices went up. And I'm talking about raw material costs. I think that's what you're talking about. They went up. Stuff I make in China went up. Um, but I did notice the willingness to pay went up too, meaning the demand. So I raised my prices. Not a lot, though. I am sensitive because customers, like I get... My companies get thousands of emails from customers a day and they are complaining about the price go up. So I try to be as competitive uh, as possible, but usually I pass on the price, absolute percentage price increase to the customer. So, but all my brands have went up in price, dude, all of them don't let and, and some of these are very easy to make. They're just doing it because they can do it. It's the most popular stuff, but more so because cost of goods have went up. They're, they're, inflation is real. It is yeah. real. The reality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's the stuff that uh, people learn in business school that that when it gets to the playing in the field, man, it's totally different application, but um, makes sense. And I actually did see a report that customer behavior, you know, buying demand went up, which is it's so interesting. You can't predict the market, really. You got to adjust to it. Yeah. I never would have thought two, three years ago that Pokemon and baseball is what it is today. They have literally went up six to 7,000%. Let me, let me think, let me give you, I would say a thousand, not six to 7,000. I was going to say six to 700, but I would say a thousand percent in the last three years. I'm talking about real demand. It's a trend and trends when they get hot, it, it's so popular and it's been holding the line too. baseball and Pokemon have been hot for, over 24 months now and it's holding the line i'm seeing record record demand for top series one baseball just shipped literally weeks ago record record demand across everywhere places you would think they would never buy baseball everyone's flocking in buying it because there's that collectability and investment aspect that people are looking for highly highly collectible that's the success 
I was just going to ask why the hype, but that, that directly answers it. That makes sense. If people, people want to get a, want to get a $10,000 card when they buy a $4 pack and they do. Right. Some cards are half a million bucks. It's pretty scary. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, I'm a winning lottery. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like people creating the demand themselves by wanting to buy into this uh, possibility of getting a big payout. Yeah. It's interesting. The hype, it's very hyped, but there's a reality to it. And you, you know, we all know when something becomes collectible, it's an investment like NFTs, like, I mean, some certain cars, um, like other collectible items, trading cards is collectible. It's an investment. So a lot of people just buy it and hold on it. And in the last five years, people are making so much money with un just holding on unopened product. It's like seven times the price in two years. So imagine they paid a hundred bucks. It's now 700 bucks. Um, kind of like NFTs, like those bored apes, man. I mean, those things were 50 grand two years ago, not even a year ago. Now they're 400 grand. So trading cards is like apes, but it's a, it's a lot bigger. I mean, it's so many more releases. It's a global element and it's, it's a powerful, powerful um, collectible item that's been around a lot longer. <laughs> right, right. <And> NFTs. <laughs> yeah, NFTs is just emerging. Yeah. And yeah. are you interested in this new space? Because in, in enjoying cards, that's enjoying collectibles in a way. Do you see yourself getting into the NFT space soon with the collectible side of it? Not with uh, collectibles, no. The NFT yeah. business in general, I have created some brands, but I have many businesses, so it's it's on the back end, and it's um, something that's coming out. It's a whole brand with a, a bunch of NFTs, kind of like the board ape and all the crypto punks and all that stuff. But NFTs with trading cards, I haven't dived into you yet, uh, yet, and I'm just gonna hold right now because I see that with trading cards. People like the idea of opening the packs. So the idea of having an NFT, some computerized image of a card, it is popular. Don't misunderstand me. Very pricey stuff. But people like opening packs, man. They love that chase. They love having 10 packs. And the one pack, they pull that $1,000 card. People love it. So that's where I'm focused on is, you know, getting the product, the actual product to people. I haven't really got into NFTs yet with collectibles. Stick to what's working. Yeah, yeah. Can't yeah, even yeah. keep up right now. <laughs> um, keep True. going, keep going. But it's like I said, it's an expanding industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I know we touched on a lot in regard to that space in and of itself. But because you have many businesses, one thing I was thinking of is I'm always interested in how the entrepreneur juggles and, and manages everything. So how do you set up your day or allocate your time so that you can get to everything uh, that's a really 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 good question um so i have real estate companies too i own buildings right. in um, california and new york uh medical office buildings apartment buildings um and i have these trading card companies so basically on a daily basis i would say i just I just usually start getting tons and tons of phone calls. <laughs> so I just get calls and managers of this warehouse are asking questions or someone's renting out a unit in Hollywood and they're like, uh, should we re renovate it? Should we do this and that? I basically have a very open line to all my employees, brokers that I'm connected with, not any broker, but brokers that I actually do business with. And the calls just start coming in. Uh, would I say you need a mind that could be multi- can multitask very well? Yes. So I could go from a building to a trading card, to a store, to an online platform in one minute. They're all my companies and I'll juggle, like you say, from one to the other. So I just get calls and I take them. And I became very good at those industries or businesses like real estate and uh, e-commerce or brick and mortar distribution and manufacturing that I just... I have a very open line with all my people and everyone right. can call me, everyone and anyone. And it works very well. I want to, I'd like to decentralize everything. So power to the people, power to my employees, get it done. Call me with questions and don't be afraid to call me.
Mm-hmm. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I have an open line and everyone's constantly interacting with me and it's, it works really well. It works yeah. very well. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the communication is, you would say one of the most important things in business and, and managing them well. It is the most important thing in business yeah. communication and speeding is to market, but you get that with communication. But the faster you are to market, the more successful you are. The faster you come out with a product line, the faster you come out with an idea, the first to come out with an idea, that's it. That's the winner. That's the power. Mm -hmm. That's number one. That's how you win in business. But communication creates that speed. So if you could could communicate fast, then you're number one. You're the fastest. So you're moving faster than any other company. Guess what that does? That makes you the best. Mm. And then for adopting new ideas, do you yeah. come up with that yourself or do you have people near you that, that you give the autonomy to say, bring this to me and we'll, say, we'll talk about it? That's an amazing question. That's really an awesome question. So fortunately, I'm in the position where I have people always trying to get a hold of me saying, I have this idea. I have this idea. Right. I would say maybe 20, 30 people try to get a hold of me a week via, via LinkedIn uh, via my websites, via my email. I mean, they, they, they do it in a lot of ways. Um, and I look at everything. So I have ideas coming to me every day of the week, which I'm blessed to have that because people are hungry and it's everywhere around the world. It's not just the US. I have people from Africa emailing me, have an idea about some, I don't know, it's some greenhouse with some products, some materials that are made for the greenhouse. So it's, it's right. awesome. It's everything and anything. Um, so I just, I don't really create ideas anymore because I have so many people coming to me and I'm pretty good at knowing of something. I'm not going to say I'm pretty good. I'm good. I'm okay at, at knowing what's going to work. I have good vision in business. I could see the future and be like, Hey, this is going to work. This isn't going to work. But you know, even if you're very good at that 10% probability of success, when you go into any new marketplace with item or service, it's, it's, it's more unlikely that you're going to fail with a new product line or service. People need to go know that going into it. Mm. Yeah. 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 As the top person in these businesses, the firm holding these businesses, you got to have the vision. I see that with every CEO we've interviewed here in the podcast, everyone I've been around friends that are absolutely crushing it. The CEO just has this judgment call, this decisiveness and vision because he knows the market well. Like I found, you know, a lot of Shark Tank episodes, biographies I read on entrepreneurs, the one thing that makes them great is they know the market. And you thoroughly enjoy when it comes to just a card, part of the many businesses you have, um, you know that super well. So you could say this is a good direction to go in or not, even besides the stats, even besides what the macroeconomics say, um, that awareness of it probably is a, is like an asset in and of itself. Yeah. It is. It definitely is. So for you, I've been picking your brain when it comes to your businesses, but is there anything that you would hand down as though like a hand me down jean or shirt to someone getting to the business field? Because anyone can now even more because everything's decentralized on internet. Absolutely. What would you say to them? Something you wish you knew going in to your career? The first thing you need, the first thing you need that I see so many youngins, I have so many teenagers coming to, coming to me, my son's friends, and they, they're like, hey, Jimmy, you know, I want to do this. I want to do that. And the first thing I tell them that I will tell anyone, and this is the first trait you need before you start business, you need to keep this inside of you throughout the whole um, uh, venture or starting in the business world is will and desire. You need to have a lot of will and a lot of desire. And there's no such thing as failure. You just keep going, going and going and persist. And you stick to it. A lot of people, including myself at certain times in my life, you quit, it's not working, screw it. Can't do that, you persist, you persist. And if there is an industry out there, you will get to it. And you will make it, but you cannot quit. It's, it's wickedly competitive. And it's, you got to just have the will and desire. That's the first. That's like the core. You need to have that mm. momentum going into it. 
and nothing can stop you because if you don't have that, you're going to get eaten up fast and it probably, you probably won't get as far as you want. You need to have that um, so much will and desire. Yeah. So before you go on to, you probably have so many stories about times where it was like a breaking point Um, because to be able to run so many businesses, you have to build up that character and resilience to do such a thing. So you have to go through kind of like the mud where Shawshank Redemption, I don't know if you've seen where he goes to the pipeline full of mud and then he ends up, you know, being in the rain, just like totally clean. Um, What were some of those moments where it felt like, you know, you're going through the mud, you're at a breaking point, but you took your own advice to what you're saying now in that being your younger self where you, you, you kept on going. Yeah. Um, are you asking me how I felt when I had the most intense pressure situation in my life that I felt like everything was going to close and cave and go out of business? Yeah. So like the example of that, so someone hearing yeah. this can be energized by it. Okay. How did I feel? Is so that how, you, how you felt or if you can give, and if you can give the exact example of, of I, okay. uh, cause I know there's many stories, but one, I have one great story and I'll <laughs> tell you how I felt first. Panic. Okay. I was completely panicked. I was scared. And um, I felt like I wasn't in control. Okay. And in business, it's important to be in control. The minute you're not in control, you should panic a little bit. You have to be in control and stay in control. So I'll tell you a story. Back in uh, 2009, 2010, it's about 12 years ago, I got myself into a situation where I had so much uh, personally guaranteed debt with banks. Okay. Now, corporate debt is corporate debt, but personally guaranteed debt is personally guaranteed. Should I explain the difference or no? Yeah, for maybe someone listening who doesn't know, it'd be helpful. Personally guaranteed debt means you borrow money and it's on your personal name. It's not guaranteed by the companies, okay? Much riskier. Um, The banks, if they call in the loan or they want the money, they could go after you personally, your personal assets, your cars, your house, anything that's in your name personally. The reason why to form corporations so you have a shell, something to kind of protect your personal name and that corporation is liable for debts, accounts payable, all that good stuff. But what, what happened with me is I took a lot of personally guaranteed debt in my corporate companies and cards stopped selling one year, two years, and sales went down 50%, but I still had all that, I had all that debt coverage, right? So the bank wanted to call in the loan and I had so much personally guaranteed debt. Uh, back then I had multiple companies, so I did sell some real estate to come sound and pay off my personal guaranteed debts. Um, But I had to make moves and timeliness was extremely important. Mm -hmm. So I got a little lucky with the timing. I don't want to go into details. It's complicated, but things happened, sold for good prices, paid off all the personally guaranteed debt. Now at this point in my life, I only have one personally guaranteed debt. That's my house in Beverly Hills, and I'm paying it off as we speak. I don't like personally guaranteed debt. I don't think anyone should do it unless you have something that's 90 to 99% complete success. It's more dangerous, and it gives the banks too much power over you, and you don't want Mm. banks to control you. So basically, that experience, uh, they called in the debt, was personally guaranteed. So even if you have multiple companies, they go after you personally. So I had to make moves. I, it affected other companies. I had to sell off assets, paid off the banks. And what I learned from it is never, ever again to have personally guaranteed debt. <laughs> and I don't. Even with my big buildings, like I have debt, but I only take about 40% leverage on my uh, 30, 40% leverage on the building. It's all just the building itself that carries the debt. My name has nothing to do with it. I just own the companies. But that was a very, very hard panicking experience and Mm -hmm. it probably will happen with most businessmen at one point in their lives is they'll come to a point where revenue softens and then all of a sudden you know your your debt exposure debt service doesn't change and then you'll have a call in the loan and if you personally guarantee it you got to move and you got to move quick because banks when they want something they want they'll liquidate you so that was my biggest learning experience i got out of it it was 2000 Nine, it started, and I got out of it about 2011 and a half, about 2012. Wow, two years of, of going through that. 
Yeah, I'd say a year and a half of highly intense negotiations, selling monster buildings that I had. They're big buildings, man. I didn't want yeah. to sell them for anything but a great, great profit and what they were worth plus more. That's yeah. usually how I do things. I don't sell things for losses. I don't sell when I want to. I mean, I don't sell when I need to. I only sell when I want to. If you ever sell real estate when you need to, bad. Only sell when you want. You'll always get a wicked high price. Right. That That's great advice. And, and to that point too, I hope people who are listening take away something from setting up the companies because it seems like you had it set up with the corporations, but in terms of the debt, you had it personally guaranteed on you. Yes. Um, so as you scale, I guess, does everyone have to leverage debt in order to do that? Or is it depends what business I guess you're in, right? No, 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 no. That's a very good question. What you just asked. What leveraging does is it helps you grow faster, right? So you could leverage your assets, then you have more capital to expand with or give money to salaries that aren't necessary and ruin it and not do the right thing. <laughs> Leverage will allow a company to grow faster. That's probably the only thing I learned in my MBA in this uh, Simon School is how leverage can make a company grow faster. But it, it also creates more risk because now you have leverage, you have debt, you have debt exposure on the company. Um, so did I answer your question? Yeah, no? yeah no, that, that, makes, that makes complete sense. It's like if, yeah. if a simplified way of explaining, if someone had uh, a credit card personally and they had bills to pay every month, it's like as though they put all of the expenses on the credit card and then when they get paid at the end of the month, they just pay off the credit card. But it's yeah. like a revolving, a revolving type of- And then they could cycle. spend more. They have more right. capital to spend more. So let's say you have a company they could do 100,000 in sales, but all they have is $20,000 in capital. And they want to be able to do that $100,000 in sales, but they need another 50,000 in capital. If they borrow the 50,000, now they're at 70,000. I'm trying to keep it simple. They do now 100,000 in sales, but they borrowed 50. But if they didn't borrow that 50, they'd only be doing 50,000 in sales or 40,000 sales. Exactly. These are all hypothetical examples. The idea is when you borrow money, you can grow faster. And sometimes that's not good. I, most of my companies now, I personally finance myself. I do not like taking line of credits. I don't like debt. I just usually line of credits, you have to personally guarantee or at least some portion of it. So I just finance it myself and I choose to grow um, strategically. <laughs> like I, I grow, but I don't need to grow 100% a year. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. Exactly. Certain times to go slow, certain times to, to rev up. Yeah. 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 So the point you made for advice for younger self, you said resilience, you know, a, a will and a desire. Is there anything on top of that, that you would impart wisdom on for younger individuals who are listening? Absolutely. With that combined with will and desire combined with always be open. When you're walking around, excuse me, anywhere you go, look around, see how the world is changing. We all see that. And then just look around and see what can work in that changing world. It's as simple as just wherever you go, just look, oh, well, maybe we're going to need this. Maybe people would like this. Just look, when you're walking down your street, look at everything and always pay attention. Always have that in your mind that what can I offer to the people of the world that they would want that's not there or I can do better than what is currently there in the marketplace? So that's one thing I know is people coming to me with ideas. They're just thinking or they're just doing something on a normal day, but they're always thinking of this idea of what can I offer to the people? And it's while you're doing things, while you're walking or while you're driving or when you go somewhere mm -hmm. new. Lots of new stimuli. And when you see that, always keep that in your head. Can I do this better for the people of the world? Mm -hmm. Because now we're in a global economy. It's the whole world. You sell to the whole world a lot of things in general. And people are the same. I've, the one thing I've learned about selling to hundreds of countries, everybody is the same, except certain religions and certain countries might have things over their heads and someone else might have hats. But in general, people are the same. Mm. except to speak different languages. So I guess, wow. I, guess I, I know that's kind of general, but it works. If you just watch everything on a daily basis, 
It's not like you go sit in your hole for an hour and think, no, just yeah. on a basis. Keep that in your thinking area. Always, always leave a, always leave a little part of your thought process for that. Anything you're doing, always think that way. And ideas will come up fast. Yeah, that makes sense. You're, you're, you can't catch them if you're not open to it. That's, that's good. That's really Absolutely. good. Yeah, That's great. But uh, I think, you know, overall, I, I talking about capturing stuff, we're open to it, capture it a lot in terms of when it comes to business, things to do well, operationally, um, ideation wise, and a lot of your story and what you do as well. If there's anything else you would like to bring up, you know, I, I always ask questions. That's the the role I play here as we're having this conversation and recording, but I like to leave space and a stage for you to talk on anything. So anything you've been marinating over, you know, realizing open to seeing in the world that's kind of dawned on you lately. And you can have this, the stage to kind of talk about that if you would like. I think, um, yeah, I, I do see something with young entrepreneurs and I'm not that old, man. I'm 46. All right. I still got 30 years in me of bad. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I'm talking about the, the young twenties, uh, the people getting out of college, the, the, the future of the business world, uh, or basically the future of the world in any um, industry, medical, whatever, but I'm, I'm a businessman. So what I'm going to talk about and say is to those people that are just getting out in the real world, it's a huge world and it could be a little bit overwhelming, but take it step by step, learn your ways, and then make your moves at the right time. Um, some of that will just come instinctively not even intuitively, instinctively, your instinct, which is basically subconscious, will tell you it's time to make this move. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that succeed in business is you make the moves at the right time. But I guess what I'm trying to say to all those young guys and girls getting out in the business world, take your time, be, do it strategically, have the will and desire, don't get frustrated because it takes time. You got to have a lot of will and desire. You got to go into it and go hard and stay hard and don't get frustrated because it could get very frustrating at times. Like it really can. But when business hits, it hits, it hits mm -hmm. hard. It's not like medicine and law. I mean, they make their hourly, whatever billing, which is good. And doctors make money for operating or seeing patients, but business is different. It's different. You can make a lot of money really fast like 10 lawyers and 10 doctors man <laughs> and you don't have to work one tenth as much but you gotta stick with it and you gotta be patient and don't get frustrated yeah when it rains when it rains it pours but yeah. well yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> both sides with business yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly that true yeah. true but that's the risk you take if you want the i mean that's the biggest player in the game i mean a businessman they're the biggest you know Usually when it comes to success, it, it, they are, and, but they take the most risk and it's not mm. easy. So you got to stay consistent and don't get frustrated, especially when you're young. When you get a little bit more christened into business, you, you learn not to get frustrated and you just roll through everything. Yeah. Yeah. You, you adapt that, that kind of shell of your own to, to be able to persist through it. That's, Absolutely. that's really great. I appreciate all of the, the words spoken, all of the wisdom imparted, experience you have to to give to others, and just let me join in on it. So, thank you, appreciate Anthony. it really much. Thank you very much, man. It's really good to meet you, dude. Absolutely, very likewise. Good.